I thought I'd start by just explaining a little bit more about what you're going to hear. This session's going to be a little bit different, I think, than what you hear in the other sessions later today uh, and tomorrow, and frankly, a little bit different than what you'll hear in a lot of talks about conversational AI. And there are a few things that I want to highlight that are different. So number one, um, a lot of the discussion around conversational intelligence is around call deflection, customer experience, uh, cost reduction. Largely what we do at Invoca, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining it to you. I'm going to actually let Eric explain his business as a way of illustrating it. A lot of our focus is actually on driving revenue. A lot of our focus is how do we take the relationship between a marketing team and a contact center team and uplift that in the organization and help executives realize the role that the contact center plays in driving revenue, acquiring, and serving customers. Um, so really quickly, broadly speaking, how many of you, if you had to describe to a fairly uh, intelligent, normal human being who's not at the Opus conference, who doesn't spend all their time thinking about conversation intelligence, how many of you would say you work in the area of the contact center here today? Okay. Who here works in the world of marketing? Cool, okay, good, that's better than I expected. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about the relationship between those two things. And I think the goal, uh, most of the Invoca customers are big consumer brands where the marketing team is here, the contact center team is here, and a lot of the work that we do is help bridge the gap between those two things. Um, the other thing that you heard a little bit of a mention of this morning um, and Dan had a line on it, although I know Dan, Dan, I noticed you skipped it, which when he talked about the overall themes uh, around conversational intelligence was the idea that searches, I think it was searches precede conversations. And the way that we think about that in VOCA is voice is not a primary resolution channel for the most part these days. It is an escalation channel. And so a lot of folks, when they go to the voice channel, they've been doing something in digital, they've been trying to do self-service, they've been researching. And so understanding that pathing of what happens in the digital self-service experience, how that escalates to a voice experience. And then oftentimes the next step that happens is back in digital. So how do you take all the insights and the information through that person-to-person -person connection and improve your digital experience on that's really important. So thinking about conversations not in a silo, but as part of a continuum that are often preceded and followed by digital experiences. And then the last piece is really, you know, this idea of conversational insight from the contact center, not only can help your agents, not only can help your managers, but really can impact broader business strategy. And I think that's really become very apparent over the past few years because there has been so much accelerated change in how we do business and how we serve customers because of first the pandemic and now just the macroeconomic pressures, which are unlike anything we've seen in the past 15 years. And so I think your ability to bring those insights from the contact center to the rest of the organization is really helpful. So with that, we're gonna get into a really practical example of how conversation intelligence is used at Oxner. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Awesome, thanks, Greg. Uh, appreciate y'all having us here today to, to talk a little bit about what we do at Oxner and the marketing team. So as Greg mentioned, Oshner is Louisiana's largest non-for-profit health system. Uh, we have been owned and operated in the New Orleans market for 80 years, um, expanded into the rest of the state, into areas of Mississippi, and soon to be Pensacola. In 2021, we served over 1.3 million patients. And while healthcare is our main focus, we do have a wellness branch as well, where we have things like a fitness center, vision center. We own and operate a hotel so that when patients come and have procedures, their family members can stay and be close nearby. Um, so we operate in a lot of different spaces. And with that comes a lot of challenges, obviously, as you have different systems, different contact centers that people are calling in different regions. So it, it leads to a lot of issues that we as marketers have to figure out a way to deal with. So I myself work on the marketing team. Uh, we have about 120 people on our marketing team. Uh, a lot of this is because we have so many different regions, we have so many different groups to support that we need a, a pretty robust staff to do that. Uh, the role of marketing, we have four different roles really that we fall into. Creative media services is the first one. Uh, this team is really responsible for generating the image and video content around the system. So 
any images, pictures that you see at auctioneer facilities, online, in YouTube, or on our paid social ads. This team is really the one that is creating that. Uh, they do a great job of finding patient stories to help you know, act as testimonials. Uh, they have frequently asked question videos with doctors on YouTube, podcasts, really just spreading great information about the system and what we can do. Uh, public relations and internal communications is uh, another area um, where they are really responsible for internal and external communication. Uh, public relations has done a great job these last two or three years with COVID, really pushing out messaging around you know, pandemic related events, got working through hurricanes that have hit the Gulf Coast. So uh, they've really been an integral part of just pushing out messaging of what we're doing from a health and safety protocol standpoint. Uh, internal communications is the other area of that, obviously uh, working with employees, uh, messaging them directly, uh, getting that messaging out to them. And then I myself work on the patient acquisition and retention team. Uh, so we're really focused on driving new people into the system, whether that's via our website, paid social ads, paid search, uh, and work on the tracking and analytics piece. So historically, we've had a very unidirectional data relationship with our contact center. It's really been the marketing team sending over, we're about to launch these campaigns. These are the keywords that you might hear. Just gives them a heads up of what those experiences are, what the people will be looking for to give them direction as to how to best route those calls. But from our side of things, we don't really get a lot in return. So just wanted to walk you through a quick uh, patient journey, of what it looks like to book at Ashner. So like most of you, you're gonna pull out your phone the first time you have a healthcare need. You're gonna search, Oshner knee pain in this situation. You get served the results and you end up clicking through to our landing page where you have knee pain, knee replacement surgery. And on here you can see, you can search for a doctor with this specialty. The patient decides that Dr. Alayuza is the doctor that they would like to see and they can go in one of two directions to book an appointment. They can either go through our patient portal where uh, they can do it all themselves online or they can make a call. And unlike a lot of industries, healthcare is probably lagging a little bit behind in how many people are doing it online themselves. And a lot of that has to do with the processes that are in place to make sure that we're reserving appointments for specific procedure types for when people have urgent needs or certain appointment types require referrals uh, for people to come into. So you can see here, we only have about 21% of our uh, appointment scheduling is coming in via online and 79% is through phone calls. I'll just add real quick. I warned Eric I was going to jump in and add some color commentary from time to time. I was amazed at this breakdown. And how many of you use Calendly? Or do you know, are you familiar with Calendly? Calendly is like a new technology that's come out over the past five years that makes it really easy to share. You know, obviously, we all use Teams or Gmail to share internal availability. But if I'm trying to schedule a consultation with Dan or Derek, I don't have visibility directly into you know, whether they're using Outlook or, or Gmail. And so Calendly helps you self-schedule across company meetings. And I looked at healthcare, I'm like, isn't scheduling an appointment with a doctor just kind of like a Calendly problem? Like, that's super easy, right? And then what you start realizing is, like, for example, uh, we're going to mix up some, the, the non-Cajuns call it Oxner and the Cajuns call it Oshner. And I'm not going to pretend to be from a place that I'm not. <laughs> Um, and so, um, you guys, like, how many of your facilities are owned and operated by Oxner properly versus their kind of like arm's length relationships? Yeah, so I'd say a majority of them are owned and operated. We have partnerships in North Louisiana, so the Shreveport Monroe markets, uh, as well as in Lake Charles. Yeah. Uh, but I'd say where a majority of our customers are coming in in the New Orleans and the Baton Rouge markets, those are owned and operated yeah. by so Oxner. If I'm a doctor and I'm owned and operated by Oxner, Eric can come to me and say, you're going to book online appointments and you're going to have this much availability. I don't care what you say. If I'm sort of affiliated and I'm independently, I can make that choice. And so one of the barriers to adoption of digital here has actually not just been technology, it's the downstream relationship between practitioners and Oxner of you've got to actually cajole, beg, and plead some of these individuals to make digital uh, self-service even available. And so I think that's why you see some of this change is slower to take place than you might imagine. Um, even though technology is making some of these things possible, it's actually kind of real constraints in the business world. Oh, for sure. 
So for us as marketers, the contact center has kind of been like a black box. They've had a big wall of data where, you know, we're running all this, this media, whether it's mobile, email, paid search, paid social, and we're spending dollars in these areas. And we don't have any insight into what those calls, the 79% of people that are booking appointments, we have no idea what they're calling about. So are they booking appointments? Are they looking for directions, trying to pay a bill? Are they calling to yell at somebody? We have no idea. So it leads to a lot of issues for us. For marketers, we have poor marketing performance because I'm over here making optimizations on our campaigns that are founded in faulty data. If I have a campaign for primary care where it's primary care near me is one of the groups and Oshner primary care is another and they both have 100 leads each and one of them's cheaper, I'm obviously gonna optimize towards the cheaper one based on the data that I have. But I'm lacking the strategic insights to know what are those calls. So there's an organizational misalignment and we're wasting resources, not on my end, where I'm spending time optimizing campaigns that probably aren't being optimized the right way, but then it's leading to more calls because people aren't getting the experience they necessarily need on our website to really have an easy transition and have that online book themselves. And it leads to a frustrating patient experience. They're stuck on hold because they're either looking for the right place to transfer to or they get transferred a million times because nobody knows what the experience the person was actually looking for was. And it leads to just an overall poor call handling experience. One thing I'd add to in the evolution of the healthcare industry, I'm gonna generalize, feel free to correct me if I'm off base here. 10 to 15 years ago, uh, I would say healthcare organizations were largely order takers. It was like, hey, if people come by, great, they'll come by, da 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 da. Because healthcare has become more competitive, now, I mean, this is why you have your role. Healthcare organizations are investing dollars in marketing to go uh, build new patient relationships. It's no longer if they show up at the front door, we'll take them. It's how do we proactively go out and find them? And so individuals like Eric in one of these organizations, you know, is essentially your job is to spend money to drive new customer relationships. And if you're not doing that, that's not good for you. It's not yeah, good no, for Oshner. Sure. It's not good for your that. career. <laughs> Yeah, no, 10, 15 years ago, the healthcare space was definitely more of just an awareness building. When you're looking at marketing, so you're looking at TV, radio, outdoor, billboard, and we really transitioned to get hyper-targeted, uh, whether it's with paid search and specific keywords, or targeting certain behaviors, or con contextual um, content online. So we've really had to make a shift, and we've, we've gotten a little more intentional with what we've been doing over time. Um, so, all these, this, this lack of data that we have is, is an issue, and this is where conversation intelligence really comes into play for us. So the journey that we had before, somebody searching for knee pain and going through the whole landing page experience, we had all that data. We knew what they were doing there. But now, with the help of Invoca and a product like Invoca, I can now see that a person's calling and scheduling to book an appointment, or they're calling because they have questions about what insurances we accept. So this is giving me a ton of information that I didn't have previously that I can now start making changes on. So we're starting to classify this information into different buckets to, to get started. Uh, right now we just have four main buckets. One is just basic information. Are they new or an existing patient? We can obviously send them down different paths based on that, give them a shorter experience where we don't need to ask as many you know, upfront questions about just their basic name, address, phone number, whatever it may be, so we can get them to their destination quicker there. And then we're trying to start solving and identifying what sort of customer issues they have. So frustrated callers, are they getting misrouted? What sort of poor experiences or numbers that do we need to change on our end to make that a better experience for them? Obviously, appointments, this is the bread and butter for me. This is what I'm focused on the most right now, is looking at appointment intent, appointment scheduled, and rescheduling appointments. And then we have this big other bucket right now that we're slowly breaking out so that we can uh, get a little bit more intentional with that data. But uh, people looking for directions, trying to pay a bill, they're having technical issues. And our goal is to now start trying to solve for some of these things. I'll tell you what, do you mind going back real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I just want to ask folks, these data categorizations probably look like some of the things you're doing today to better equip your contact center agents and managers, right? The thing that you don't realize is there's a whole other audience. If you're in financial services, telecom, automotive, travel and hospitality, insurance, healthcare, there's a whole other audience of people at your organization who's interested in this data that you probably don't know is interested in this data. And that's what's sort of interesting when um, Derek and Dan talked about, you know, 
AI, conversational AI, not going anywhere but being everywhere, I think this is a great example of how this level of granular detail data is actually very useful with very hard ROI uh, tied to very strategic level executive. As a CEO, I can tell you, like acquiring new customers, pretty top of mind for me, and certainly at an organization like Oxner. So it's just sort of interesting to see two different constituencies coming at a data set from two very different directions for very different reasons. Go ahead, Dan. So, you get a this? so this is something that right now we're looking at just after the fact. We're just listening to calls and, and really starting to set up these signals and bucketing people into each. Uh, Greg's team's been outstanding to help us from just a, a resource perspective because uh, some of this is just outside of our expertise as marketers. You know, we're we're more focused on what keywords these people are searching for and how do we optimize those campaigns. So Greg's team has brought the technical aspect in to really help us uh, set some of this up so we can you know, really gain some of this data. From the CRM perspective, you know, we're, we're new to the CRM world. We, we work with Salesforce. Uh, our contact center was on a different uh, CRM, so we weren't really speaking to one another. So that's where that walled garden really was, was coming into play. Uh, so now we're, we're really focused on trying to get on the same page and bring uh, these different data points together. Um, so work in progress, but uh, learning a lot from it, you know? And, and I would add, Dan, um, so I have a confession to make. I worked at Salesforce as a product manager for about a decade, so I know what types of things we as a CRM company would say. Um, and I think there are two realities here. Number one, in businesses that have retail locations like healthcare, um, there's no unified system of record necessarily behind all those different things. So if you, versus a, like a USA with a contact center. USA has, I'm sure, um, you know, like a Cisco Avaya Nice 5.9 kind of core contact center platform that's a system of record for all those conversations. When you get into automotive or healthcare, you know, you've got a central contact center, you've got sort of mom and pop field uh, offices. There's no center of data for all that, center of or system of record for that conversational data. And then even in the big USAA, like we work with companies like AT&T, um, in theory, they have all that data. Um, Neil, I'll look at you since you're from Accenture. <laughs> You understand the challenges of integrating all that data and getting all that data together in one spot. And so a lot of times what we're doing, even with enterprise customers that have more central systems of record, stitching that data together is really challenging. Voice actually becomes a really interesting, fast, agile proxy for that data. Um, but a lot of customers will say to me, like, don't we have that data? I'm like, great, bring it to us. We can technically integrate it as well. That just tends to take a lot of time. Yeah, so this has definitely been, uh speeding up the process for us to be able to use this sort of data. And we've been using it primarily for me is to improve marketing ROI. So now I can go back and look at the primary care campaign that we were talking about. The primary care near me was the more expensive cost per call, but it's driving 65% appointment booking versus the other one where people were searching Oshner primary care, that's only driving 40%. So I can go back, realize the optimizations I was making were wrong, and now I know other keywords are gonna be driving a higher ROI and that's just gonna make us look better at the end of the day. So from an ROI perspective, that's how we're starting to use the appointment booking insights. And we're now in entering right now the generating customer insights. So we can start looking at what are the other experiences that people are looking for, the directions, the billing. Okay, we don't have a lot of that information on some of our landing page that our ads are driving to. How do we start adjusting the experience on our website to make it easier for them so we can potentially reduce calls to the contact center but still get those bookings? And then finally, uh, Greg, I know this was one you were going to talk about, diagnosing and solving the patient experiences. We haven't had a chance to really dive into why people are on hold for a long time or why they're getting misrouted a ton from a marketing perspective. Uh, it's something that we're, we're planning to dive into with the contact center to identify, is it something that marketing can help solve? But Greg, I know you said you had worked with some other clients. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting is from a marketer's point of view, um, you know, marketers think a lot about customer experience. 
And so what we've seen is traditionally, if you had sort of a maverick marketer who was really passionate about customer experience, they'd want to understand when somebody is looking for a physician, they go to a landing page, maybe they try scheduling online, and then they call and have a conversation. Down the road, more traditional marketers would essentially say, that's not my job. Like when somebody picks up the phone and calls into the contact center, not my job, my job's done. Um, more maverick, more rebellious, more passionate about the customer experience, marketers would say, what's going on downstream of me? What can I use to understand my process and make it better? And can I hold the contact center team accountable? What's changing is in this macroeconomic environment, marketers are going, I need to account for every single dollar that I'm spending. And the data that we have in Voca across all of our customer shows approximately depending on industry, anywhere from 10 to 35% of conversations that are inbound, that are being driven by marketers who are judged on their performance, go unanswered. And marketers traditionally are like, not my problem. In this environment, when their CFOs and their CMOs are chasing them with a stick, they're like, hey, what's going on with that 15, 20%? Are these after hours conversations? What times are contact center close? Should I stop spending money at 11 o'clock at night on Google because I'm driving conversations that people call and run into a brick wall because they can't talk to people? So I think one of the things we're seeing is the marketing contact center collaboration around customer experience is moving from being aspirational in the good times to required because of the financial pressure that a lot of these companies are feeling and frankly, the intensified pressure on customer experience. Um, because customers are under more financial pressure than ever themselves, and if you don't deliver a great experience, they'll go somewhere else. Yeah, and, and just to speak to the, the contact center and marketing aligning on, you know, contact center hours and stuff like that, we also need to be focused on when are patients most likely to book? What time of day is that? And if the contact center is not open, how do we start changing that experience? Because we do see a lot of bookings that happen after 6 p.m., all the way up till midnight. You'll get a lot of people booking from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. So. Obviously, those are hours that are not your traditional contact center hours. So where can we start driving a different experience for our patients when they're coming in at those hours and make sure they're getting the help that they need? So uh, a challenge that we're, we're trying to figure out and hopefully with the help of the contact center, we can set up some, some good processes there. Um, last couple things. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, Last couple of things. So this isn't a healthcare problem. I would say this is a broad, uh, if you ever hear the word considered purchase industry problem. I was actually out at Google headquarters yesterday for an event, not with their like contact center AI team, actually with their ads teams. And one of the th stats that I thought was really interesting is, is Google looks at their advertiser base. 50% um, of their advertisers are in industries where they make money through uh, a purchase path that includes the contact center or a retail store. Um, so compare and contrast that versus like Amazon or uh, an online retailer for clothes where all that money goes through e-commerce. Um, for Google, that means half their advertisers are in these businesses where the contact center or re retail location plays a really important uh, component of driving value. And as a marketer, marketing, I hate to diminish what you do, but if I conceptualize it for a room full of non-marketers, it is effectively a money in, money out game. It is a big algorithm that says, I'm spending money in all these places and I have granular understanding of the impact of my business and now I'm just gonna use AI to optimize those things. Um, and so Google is looking at this as like, hey, how do we help marketers and brands and companies that are in these areas where people buy stuff offline? So this gives you an example of the types of companies that uh, we work with. Um, and, and I think my message to you would be, it's pretty common to have this marketing contact center disconnect. And typically what we see with our customers is there's a lot of opportunity in driving more collaboration between the two, both from a customer experience perspective and from a hard line dollars and cents. And I think going back to this point of every conversation is preceded and followed by a digital touch. Um, what's interesting is when we get these conversational AI insights, we'll pin these to a customer record. We will pin these to a customer profile. So the example I always use in telecom is in September and October, when I'm seeing a bunch of advertising for the new iPhone, and I call in and have a conversation with an AT&T or a Verizon or a T-Mobile, and I say, if I want to get the new iPhone for my wife and myself, what does that mean for my plan? How do I upgrade, et cetera, et cetera? The next day, if I go show up on the website and they have an offer that says, get a new Samsung Android device, it's like, I just told you yesterday I'm an iPhone person. Why are you showing me on the homepage an offer for an Android phone when I've told you what I want? 
And so the conversational insight and being able to attach that to a customer profile and a Salesforce and an Adobe and a CDP, like that's really powerful insight, uh, especially for marketers who are usually traditionally watching individual click streams to try to guess at what people's intent is. If they go down these five pages, I think they're interested in XYZ, as opposed to now a technology, you can just listen to an active conversation and tie that in. Um, and the other thing that I'll end with is, while we've talked a lot about marketing in the contact center, uh, a lot of this technology is really relevant in contact center specific projects as well. So if you think about virtual agents or agent assist, um, I'll give you an example. We work at DirecTV. DirecTV has a, uh, an offering where if you love professional sports and if you love the NFL, you can go, I think it's called the Red Zone Package. And so we did some work with DirecTV where if a consumer went and searched for Red Zone Package, came to a landing page, looked at an offer where it said 30% off the Red Zone Package if you sign up for DirecTV Streaming or DirecTV Traditional today, and they called into an agent, we would pass that context to the agent in real time. And so the agent knew what you were interested in even before the conversation started. You weren't having to parse the conversation in real time with 100 millisecond latency and understand those things. Although that stuff was all good too, but you could see from the digital journey what the consumer was interested in. Now, DirecTV didn't have their agents go, Derek Top, I see that you were searching on a web page and you landed here and the offer you wanted was XYZ, because that's creepy. What the agent would do would go, hi Derek, great to speak with you. I'm glad you're interested in DirecTV. We have a special this month with 30% off our Red Zone package. Would that be of interest to you? It's the exact thing he was looking at on the website. And Derek's reaction is like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. That's amazing. And it's technology who brings that context to the agent. So if you think about a virtual agent, having a sense of, did a consumer look at a knowledge article about a widget and then another article about a widget and another article about a widget and then call in? They're probably trying to figure out what's the problem with that specific widget and being able to pass that data into a virtual agent to like zone down the solution set will help reduce the number of turns. Using that routing to get them to a product specialist, I'll come to you real quick in just a second, sir. Using that data to route the call. Um, if you've got somebody who has been on the website for 10 minutes, they're probably pretty frustrated. You might want to change the routing of that call versus somebody who's just hit the homepage. Um, and being able to take all this feedback loop and analyze where is digital self-service failing? Where are people escalating out of digital self-service, or what we do a lot in sales and marketing use cases, where are people calling when they're in the buy flow? If I've put items in my shopping cart in the buy flow and then I call in, you wanna get that call answered immediately because that's someone who effectively has their finger right over the buy button. So there's a lot of interesting analogies here around understanding the transition from digital to conversational and then taking those conversational insights by looking through the call using technology and distilling those key intents and outcomes and appending those to the customer record. So anyway, that's broad scope. You wanna go ahead, sir? Yeah. Customer who's come in, I get it. Yep. If it's a prospect who yep. hasn't identified themselves, how can you relate that? It's the easiest thing in the world, yet incredibly hard to manage on the back end. So what we do is instead of having a generic like 1-800 number that you call, we have a piece of JavaScript that sits on the website and provisions a unique number for a unique web session. And that actually becomes the key where we can connect a Google ID, Adobe ID, a CDP ID on the website to what happens in the conversation. And that's not relying on you doing a bunch of back integration work. That just like magically happens. The craziness behind our platform is we have to support customers like AT&T. You can imagine how many web sessions happen every single day with AT&T. So there's a ton of technology behind the scenes that's looking at how do we manage pools of numbers and how do we do all those things. But that becomes the unique key to pull together what happened in the digital world, what happened in the conversational world, how can I marry all that data together without having to ask you to go do a year project to marry all this stuff together that only really works for authenticated users. So that's part of the, part of the secret. That, the AI of understanding the conversation, and then the integration throughout the whole customer engagement stack, that's kind of the core secret sauce. Um, I'm around, Eric's around. <laughs> Uh, Delva works in the inside sales team, runs the inside sales team at Barbecue Guys. She's around if anybody has questions. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time and hope you all have a good conference. For more analysis and expertise in conversational AI and intelligent authentication, visit opusresearch.net.